building predictive models has been an obsession of mine since I started as a quantitative trader. With my lifelong research for those causal factors explaining the bulk of price formation now largely behind me, and with the recent worldwide events proving the urgency to investigate humanity's dismally low aggregate state of consciousness, I have decided to dedicate a good portion of my time to unravel the core drivers of human behavior, understand why as a species we have become such fervently willing actors of our own enslavement, and especially how to mechanically reverse course. This journey led me on a path across the occult sciences of behaviorism to unearth forbidden literature and comprehend how our behavior was shaped and engineered by design through social conditioning into that of a slave. This is what I found. And this is how I snapped out of slave think. So first of all, why make such a video? After all, this is a quantitative trading channel, so what the heck am I doing talking about human consciousness all of a sudden? Well, that's actually very simple. We are about to lose everything very soon if we do not rise in consciousness, and quickly so. And all the money in the world will mean nothing if, for lack of understanding of morality, we let our freedom and property be stolen from us without resistance, and very often with our active consent. So trading needs to take a step back today. As quantitative traders, we are more prone than others to rely on consequential proof to guide our actions than let ourselves be driven by emotions. So our community has less excuses than most not to level up and understand this cardinal truth definitively. This is where I situate this video. Now I want to stress that I am no exception and no better than anyone with that respect. I started like most people, in all my hardened, egotistic and politically polarized worldview. For years, just like you, I was indoctrinated in the supposedly indisputable fact that the West was the world's beacon of light when it comes to human rights, that people were undoubtedly free here, and that democracy was the gold standard of societal organization. So much so that I would ignorantly use the words liberty and democracy interchangeably without thinking twice about it. I was told to instinctively stand for the flag, to mindlessly reply thank you for your service like Pavlov's dog at the mere mention of the words police or military, and to look up to government and its monopoly on violence as the legitimate guarantor of my freedoms. I was told that as long as I shot for top education, complied with my local laws and got a good job, a paid for house and two and a half kids, I would have a great life and that it would somehow make me a good person. That was the promise. That's what they told me to believe. And I believed it. Except that just about none of it matched reality. And in fact, nothing even passed the scrutiny of an objective intellectual assessment. The first wake-up call came when I finally decided to give up entirely on going for my PhD after I put to use what I learned in the market and my dwindling bankroll forced me to realize that all that Ivy League so-called peer-reviewed financial education that I paid an exorbitantly high price tag for was certainly giving me a good technical outlook on the issue but was not making any difference as to my investment results over the average Joe. In fact, it made it worse because unlike a layman, all of that academic priming stunted my ego into refusing to recognize that I had been fooled and it kept me from looking for improvement outside of conventional knowledge. It was only when I finally overcame this mental block built by years of irrational conditioning to worship institutional authority that I finally opened the way for the actual progress that made me into the trader that I am today. And I saw all of this overpriced education for what it truly is. A mere glorified license to create your slot as a corporate drone and a fantastic networking tool for the least gifted students to grovel their way to the top of the corporate food chain and for their parents to cluelessly brag about their kid's title and status at the neighborhood barbecue party. I was better than that. That's when my self-esteem took over. With that cynical approach to agreed upon wisdom then firmly in place, I started digging further into alternative sources of knowledge from finance of course, all the way to politics, health and philosophy. As a finance guy, those glaring inconsistencies between the official freedom narrative and our current fiat system is what had me pull the string that unraveled everything else. I had to ask. If the West was indeed that world beacon of human and economic freedom, then why in the world was our financial system inextricably led by a central and unaccountable institution, namely a central bank, which is one of the core tenets of communism? Why was it that our entire financial system forced us by default to store and denominate our wealth into depreciating notes of debt? Why weren't we educated about it from an early age instead of letting us find out the hard way, or not at all? If I were free, then why was I stolen of a growing portion of my income every year under the threat of being hurt or caged by an armed gang? And indeed, if I were a truly free, self-standing human being, 
then why was I tagged at birth with an ID number like a domesticated animal, then called a citizen and expected to owe allegiance to the state through a fictitious social contract without my express consent? And why was I only granted permission and limited access to weapons for my self-defense? Also, despite our largely collectivized economic fabric, how come people had even been so easily convinced that the bulk of their problems today came from a failure of capitalism, when capitalism itself actually disappeared in the late 1800s to make room for corporatism? How was corporatism even tolerated in a supposed free economy when it consists in an incestuous collusion between governments and preferred companies where regulation is leveraged to impair free market competition and eradicate small businesses to instill the status quo and capture their clients? If democracy was the gold standard of political organization that it's cracked up to be, then why did the economy only get worse with every passing congress and president, no matter which side they claim to bat for? Why did I have to pay a property tax to keep owning a home that I already paid for? And lastly, why did I have to ask for permission and get a license for doing just about anything of importance to start with? Free men don't ask for permission. Surely, I did not live in a free society by any objective standard. And despite all the unthinking hype, democracy certainly was not that benchmark of freedom worth striving for. It became abundantly clear that thinking otherwise would only be a symptom akin to a variation of that Stockholm Syndrome that pushes slaves to rationalize both their subordination and the power given to their master. And there was only one way through it, by breaking the ego and snapping out of this irrational illusion. Observing that reality collide and conflict with my inculcated beliefs is what triggered a daily grind to deconstruct my thoughts and drill down to that level zero root cause that explains our instinctive acceptance of that subordinated stupor that afflicts most of us and that I call slave think. Unlike the crooked system that we have all been groomed to trust, it turns out that the answer to our freedom is to be found anywhere but in the political realm. There is no escaping the plantation by using its suggestion box. Once you understand the philosophical and psychological underpinnings of the insidious slavery system that captured us as a society, you also understand that there can't be any political party or providential man coming to save you. Ever. And yes, that also invalidates the cult of personality for your beloved candidate or whatever savior you like to dream about. In this realm at least, nobody's coming to save you from your apathy as you're spectating this devolution as if it's some kind of Hollywood movie that you're not a part of. This responsibility shifting thought of an external savior is actually nothing but a glaring proof of our immaturity and our state of utter domestication as a species. Whether you find yourself cheering for democracy or not, one thing that everybody should be able to agree on by now is that it at least failed to revert the runaway power-grabbing government insanity that we have allowed to control our lives recently. Or at worst, it promoted it. Once you cut through your social programming, this political veil of illusion is actually not that hard to dispel. Unlike dictatorships where power is clearly identified and makes the oppressive political system easier to blame, the underhanded and much more dangerous aspect of democracy is that the illusion of choice among candidates and parties leverages instinctive tribalism to distract the populace from the actual power grab, induces it to blame the men in power, yet excuses the system as a whole in a never-ending loop of vote and re-vote. If it didn't work out this time, it is because this man was not the right one, correct? So let's do away with him and try once more, and then once more. That's the gist of it. And that's also why decades later, you find yourself complaining about your country's situation, rallying for the next snake oil salesman, and counting how much less freedom you are left with at the end of their term, again and again, without rest. It is often stated in that regard that you can't complain if you don't vote. I do not know how much clearer it can be made that the opposite is actually correct. The logical fact is, you can't complain about your slavery if you keep participating in its administration. None of this nonsense would be possible if you realize that your choice is in fact restricted to the allowed options only, with the societal outcomes for every single one of them captured by the state. Think about it. Where is the vote that allows you to opt out entirely while remaining free to interact with your fellow men on a voluntary basis? It doesn't exist, for the precise reason that you are not free to choose. Your so-called freedom is limited to the confines of the collectivist system that is the plantation, which you call nation, and that keeps your wiggle room structurally subjugated to the assumed authority of the state. 
Whether you're still playing this absurd political sandbox, are labeling yourself a liberal or conservative and prefer to remain in denial of this illusion altogether, is irrelevant to the issue though. On either side of the political spectrum, the belief in using the political game to forcibly subjugate another portion of the population into doing something that it does not want to do in order to benefit you is what makes you, deep down, a communist that loves the idea of actual individual freedom. Let me drive this point home even further and make it extra clear in case that offended you. Regardless of which side of the dog and pony show you like to think of yourself to be on, the belief that we should sacrifice individual freedom for the fake promise of order and securing the common good is, by definition, what communism is. It is a religion, quite literally, a belief that holds you back in your actual comprehension of the problem. And more precisely, it's the religion of state authority or statism. Once again, playing that game de facto makes you a communist. If you really think about it, you will find out that your only point of disagreement with the other party is what kind of flavor of collectivism you wish to violently impose on others. That's it. Now if that's you, I would suggest that you go in front of a mirror and tell yourself that face to face. Because that's what made me accept the reality of the political scam and stop lying to myself about it. You still with me here? Here is how your cognitive bias and traumatic abandonment issues are used against you. As a liberal, the left-wing political bias takes advantage of your general incline for motherly protection to view the state as the nurturing solution to relieve you from the responsibility of sustaining yourself and provide comfort for your family against life's adverse events. As a conservative, the right-wing political bias takes advantage of your general incline for fatherly protection to view the state as the powerful solution to relieve you from the responsibility to protect yourself and provide security for your family against outside threats. As you can see, if the flavor is different, the way your psyche is getting exploited and turned against you to suck you into the political scam and give up your freedom is always the same. You are tricked into believing that there is such a viable solution as cowardly transferring your responsibility to other people for them to take care of you as their surrogate child. The hope for such a positive outcome to materialize, however, is complete superstition. It has never happened and cannot happen in reality with the exact same certainty provided by the law of gravity. Said plainly, just as sure as a dense object will not rise if you drop it, the way the laws of the universe are arranged makes it so that a positive outcome mechanically cannot come about from restricting or denying individual freedom without also eventually causing immense harm to both the individual and society as a whole. No matter how much antagonizing between individual rights and the so-called common good is being propagandized every day. In fact, there can be any common good without individual freedom respected first. Reverse that order and the consequences are always the same. Crime, death, poverty, tyranny, and all-out chaos. What we are seeing today is the culmination of that self-destructive process based on abject immorality. And we are way too deep in the process for individuals not to finally take notice and change course in a hurry. The unprecedented government overreach started in 2020 should have been a dire wake-up call for most of us. The sheer madness of this oddly synchronistic chain of events revealed not only the death of the general state of compliant hypnosis that afflicts the bulk of society, but also, unfortunately so, it did reveal its actual cognitive root cause. A root cause that turned out to be nothing but a learned mental disease that we are all injected with through what we call socialization, with most of it consisting of being forced to sit for years in Prussian-inspired indoctrination camps, where unconditional obedience to authority and social conformity are both rewarded and falsely represented as a mandatory precondition for any functioning society. The result of this debilitating psychological grooming process is what explains the widespread gullibility that translated into leading the majority to tolerate, rationalize, justify, and especially excuse away the most vicious attacks on their basic rights by the very institutions that claim to serve them. Regardless of the latest hype pushed by state media though, be it in the name of a fake pandemic, a made-up environmental crisis, engineered supply chain scarcity, more political theatrics, or a well-planned war where both sides are controlled by the same group, every single infringement on individual freedom was justified by so-called emergency circumstances or the claimed necessity to protect you and keep you safe. It's for your safety, remember? And most people bought it. It is still astonishing to see that the vast majority of the population still hasn't woken up to the fact that resorting to the Hegelian dialectic, meaning to create an artificial crisis 
and then use fear to leverage the rhetoric of safism, has been the tired textbook blackmailing tactics used by governments to advance their power grabs over their population since the dawn of times. This level of naive collective cluelessness about these archaic political tricks is actually so deep-seated that people seem to draw their blind trust in the authorities from the belief that the mere claim of protection used by the state cannot be anything else other than trustworthy. It is as if most tyrannical regimes somehow never used any deceptive alibi to turn people's compassion against them and claim the so-called common good to assert their power when this strategy is actually the norm, not the exception. How many times when raising this point have you heard back? But they would never do that to us. The right answer to that is, no, you would never do that. Psychopath, on the other hand, would not hesitate one second. Yet most cannot comprehend that the mere fact that they cannot fathom having been duped is the very definition of brainwashing. It's gotten so bad that it would be fair to ask ourselves what upcoming egregious narrative would the public not believe and promote at this point. Regardless, whether you bought these official crisis stories hook, line and sinker is ultimately not the point. What matters is to understand why you're letting yourself get programmed and polarized that easily. Why your TV tells you to think something and you think it without the slightest bit of resistance. To the point that you find yourself systematically jumping on the bandwagon and rallying to cheers the latest socially trendy narrative on Twitter, you feel compelled to take sides and play directly in the hands of the strategy of divide and conquer, and you give up more and more of your basic rights in the process as you cheer the imposition of the state-approved worldview as well as the cancellation of the rights of those who refuse to go along with the mass psychosis that you fell victim to. In a nutshell, you need to realize why you have been made to be so soft. Evolving beyond that low state of consciousness is obviously possible, but I was never satisfied with the vague requirement that one must so-called expand one's consciousness in order to escape that mind prison. Practically speaking, what does that even mean? I needed something more specific and actionable. As I progressed in my research, I stumbled upon the answer which kept coming back recurringly from different occult traditions, never to be named specifically, but described in a way that must have been purposely eviscerated from the education system because it was unrecognizable at first sight. What made it easier this time though, is the flu-19 hysteria that made it all the more straightforward to verify and test the veracity of the information that I gathered. It basically turned the world into a test lab and a magnifying glass for the consequences of that one causal factor that I uncovered. Once again, there is nothing new here. I did not invent anything. I merely unearthed it from past occult literature. And as it turns out, the cognitive root cause explaining this self-loathing degenerative behavior that afflicts most of us has actually a name. It's called solipsism. Solipsism, which is another name for moral relativism, is at the core of this inculcated slave thing that the bulk of society is entrapped in. While many will insist that it is the financial system that keeps us into bondage and that somehow a new technology like private blockchains will deliver us from it, this important technological solution alone is aimless and will not bear any fruit still because it is not tackling the actual causal factor that shapes our perception which itself leads to our behavior. The occult knowledge describing solipsism, however, explains it entirely, and here is how. The process of seemingly removing objective truth from your intellectual and cultural landscape has this primary consequence to leave a vacuum for an external power to define reality for you. In delegating the definition of truth to the very relativistic appreciation of the state, which is nothing but other humans, is it any wonder then that most people have failed to protect their rights when their solipsistic upbringing led them to not even know what a right objectively is anymore and how to define it? Ask around and you'll see for yourself. Heck, even ask yourself, can you define precisely in less than 5 seconds what a right is without looking it up on Google? Quick, you should be able to. But the fact that most of us can't is the norm, unfortunately, and as I said, it is by design. You were educated to think that way, in order to make you more controllable. How many times have you heard a right to be defined as any action that is allowed by the state, or someone else's behavior that you would not mind affecting you? This is fundamentally incorrect, because that is not an objective definition and it will not stand the whims of human appreciation. So if people cannot readily define what a right is, how would you expect anyone to defend something they can't even describe definitively? The fact is that a right is firmly tied to objective morality. Conversely, without objective morality, the logical conclusion is that you can have no rights. Whereas objective morality describes a natural consequential order that defines rights which are the basis for freedom, 
relative morality is an incoherent man-made edifice that can only create mere permissions which are the basis for slavery. And just like the laws of physics dictate the consequential order of physical actions and reactions, the behavioral laws surrounding objective morality dictate the binding consequences of society's aggregate behavior with the exact same scientific degree of objectiveness, reproducibility, and mechanical predictability as the laws of physics. This is in stark contrast with the whimsical stately decrees and edicts that cannot be verified nor tested consistently as they vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The crux of this issue is that, in truth, every human action that is objectively moral becomes a right, with capital R, right. When it is not, it is a crime. So a right can be defined using the apothetic method or defining a concept by what it is not, meaning a right is all actions that do not cause a direct and intentional and transitive and provable harm to another sentient being. Notice how I stated and, not or. Direct means that it must emanate from your own action without involving any intentional third party. Intentional itself is self-evident. Your ultimate intent was to bring in full force the predictable consequence of your criminal action. Transitive implies that it must be a first-order physical consequence, and provable means that a link can be scientifically established and reproduced given a preset of circumstances. This all-encompassing objective understanding of rights readily answers many hot topics that have polarized society for ages, made the bed of political crooks, and will equally infuriate both sides of the political spectrum which largely have no clue about what a right actually is, regardless of how much they claim to be pro-freedom. For example, the use of drugs, which is illegal in most countries, is irrevocably a right. No matter the harm that it might cause you and how much I would not recommend anyone doing it, it is objectively anyone's right to put whatever they want in their own body. Because it is their own body. Repressing the use of drugs at the state level is therefore a crime or organized crime to be precise. You don't need the legal system to tell you that. You can know it definitively using simple logic. Likewise, abortion, which is objectively the murder of another person temporarily dwelling in a surrogate body, is most definitively a crime, more precisely, first-degree murder in that case. You don't need a legal system to tell you that either, you can know it definitively. Another way to understand a right is the strict respect of private property in all of its forms, be it bodily integrity, material property, trust, etc. In a nutshell, a single requirement which implies the following commandment, do not steal. So now we can readily understand that there can't be any rights of freedom without private property. Both are inextricable from one another. Therefore, the mutual respect of other people's rights and private property in a society mechanically underpins the access to freedom for everyone. This phenomenon is dictated by the consequential law of individual and aggregate behavior, also called natural law or moral law. The strict observance of natural law is therefore intimately dependent upon the absolute preservation of private property. Conversely, it becomes self-evident that there can't be any such thing as collective property in nature either. The fictitious and self-contradicting concept of collective property can only be forced on individuals and in doing so will necessarily create chaos and slavery. Natural law is not a flaky concept, it is a science. Just like the laws of physics in the physical realm, natural law models, explains and predicts flawlessly the consequences of our aggregate behavior as a society. And just like the laws of physics, it is binding and cannot be escaped. It applies to all sentient beings equipped with the capacity for free will choice, which obviously excludes animals. Natural law is therefore the consequential universal order that dictates the societal outcome that follows the observance of objective morality or lack thereof. In other words, whenever objective morality rises in a society, individual freedom invariably prospers. On the contrary, whenever it is not strictly observed in the aggregate, natural law will bring about negative consequences to the human condition with absolute certainty every single time. And with the off-the-charts level of government encroachment on public freedoms worldwide, this statement alone should chill you down the spine as to where humanity stands as a species today as far as respecting strict moral and property standards. Carefully stripping our education from the knowledge that morality can be defined objectively is how governments have instrumentalized moral relativism to replace or supersede individual moral action with the relativistic and collectivized dictates of the state that we call law, lowercase l, law. 
In fact, no matter how beneficial it was to reassert the obvious at their historical time, such documents as the US Constitution have been weaponized by focusing the attention of those who value individual freedom into believing that said freedom was only coming from and guaranteed by a stately piece of paper. And as we just saw it, rights and freedom do not come from relativistic man-made papers. They do not come from man. And unlike permissions, they cannot be suspended nor revoked. Rather, they are immutable, and demonstrably so because they come from the very laws of nature and the consequences of their observance can be consistently systematized and measured scientifically. Transmutating this objective notion into a relative one in the collective psyche has ensured that we consider our fundamental rights as mere permissions, our freedom as dependent on other men, so that we implicitly view ourselves as legitimate slaves. This prevented the religion of the state to be called out for what it is, a dangerous religion founded on the unthinking cult of authority, which does not exist in nature, but can only be socially engineered into a superstition through years of indoctrination. A superstition in a godlike organization that can somehow create and revoke rights out of thin air. A cult with its supreme guru dictating the line of thought, its priest class, its commandments, its plantation guards, its crusaders, and its devotees. The truth is that men's decrees are intrinsically and in every way subordinated to natural law, because all that they can achieve is to either confirm a right that already exists under natural law, deny a morally legitimate right, or create a morally illegitimate authorization. So clearly, legal and moral cannot and should never be conflated with one another, as is almost always done by people whose values are caught in moral relativism. Legal is either redundant with morality or the furthest thing away from it. In the end, it has nothing. It can only detract from it. The cognitive cancer that is brought about by moral relativism is designed to keep its praise blind to this reality and away from reasoning in terms of first principles. This mind disease is what ultimately allows circumstantial exceptions to be rationalized instead of being viewed as unacceptable and non-negotiable from an objectively moral standpoint. Because it does not and cannot flow naturally, moral relativism requires to resort to the use of violence or deception in order to be enforced in the physical plane. And it invariably results in the societal organization that is often referred to as the so-called law of the jungle, which is, by definition and unlike what we are taught, the very system of power distribution existing under government rule, whereby whichever men controlling institutions and their monopoly on violence are left to rule unconditionally and with impunity and despite the democratic alibi provided by the political theater. Conversely, observing natural law is grounded in objective morality, what it applies to is clear-cut, how it works and what it entails flows naturally and voluntarily, and its outcome cannot be distorted, manipulated, compromised or negotiated in such a way that would be detrimental to the basic rights of the individual. This is the actual law of attraction. Not the New Age bullshit that parades as it, and seeks to obfuscate its objective understanding. That is why that knowledge is carefully occulted, because allowing it to proliferate would immediately impair the legitimacy of the plantation itself, and would nullify the authority of the state. One of the main rebuttals for the existence and sustainability of a societal organization based in natural law is the fact that most humans are not moral, thereby supposedly making it a naive social construct at best. While it is true that most men are not moral indeed, this unsustainability claim is flawed though, because it stems from an incomplete understanding of what natural law actually is. Natural law is not just based on the sacred feminine moral principle of non-aggression that we just defined, but also, and this is crucial to understand, on the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. Both cannot be dissociated from one another, and the latter is there to ensure that the former be respected at all times. This definition further outlines the difference between force and violence, which are almost always conflated with one another, whereas they are actually two opposite terms in both purpose and legitimacy. Whereas force is the legitimate and moral use of kinetic energy to redress a violation of the non-aggression principle, violence, on the other hand, is the illegitimate and immoral use of kinetic energy to violate rights in spite of the non-aggression principle. Understanding that aspect makes it very clear why a moral and therefore a free society cannot exist without its members having a full and permanently unconditional access to any and all mediums of self-defense. In particular, it reveals the absurd illegitimacy of restricting innocent individuals away from exercising fully their right to forcible self-defense, while confining the use of violence to an external organization made of those same sentient beings, naively thinking that this special class of people cannot be corrupted when this very organization relies on slavery to exist. 
through mind control and relativism. Populations have thus been indoctrinated in the superstitious fact that they can somehow proclaim an institutional ritual like an election to transfer to the state a right to violence that they do not morally possess individually in the first place. Or in other words, that they can somehow dream up a superstitious dance to turn a wrong into a right. This viscerally irrational thought process shows once more the depth of the mind control affecting most of us, how moral relativism is devoid of any logic, and that the belief in authority can only be based in superstition to thrive on the cognitive dissonance of its subjects. A great part of the intentional confusion that we're subjected to when it comes to morality relies on the obfuscation of semantics and the heavy use of euphemisms to reinforce the brainwashing and deflect the fact that this moral bankruptcy cannot be reconciled logically. When the state does it, harassing becomes interrogating, murdering becomes neutralizing, stealing becomes seizing, and blackmailing most recently became incentivizing. Here's another example. The absence of master or authority, which mechanically leads to freedom under natural law, is quite literally the strict definition of the word anarchy. Yet, how many of you are still using anarchy as a synonym for chaos? See what they did there? Indoctrinating you to equate true freedom under natural law and social order with chaos. And why wouldn't you? After all, terrorist groups like Antifa label themselves and are labeled by mainstream media as anarchists, when they are in fact its diametrical polar opposite in deeds, purpose, and philosophy. This intentional confusion is what I'm talking about. You must relearn or at least verify the true meaning of words epistemologically, then think again and call out any authority for the fraud that it is. Not out of personal preference or the obtuse rebel mind of a retarded teenager, but out of a mature look at cold logic. People must come to the realization that freedom can only be created through their individual responsibility to respect objective morality above everything else and enforce natural law by themselves internally through sheer willpower and without relying on any external counterparty to do it for them. In plain street language, that would be called growing a spine. Owning one's freedom and not surrendering your self-sovereignty to the religion of state authority requires a daily dose of courage and self-respect, two values that are largely gone nowadays. And this too is by design. The cultural byproducts of moral relativism largely revolve around Satanism, which by the way has little to do with the cult of the devil, but rather everything to do with, among others, the all-about-me self-absorbed egotism and the lack of care for anything else other than self. The advent of social media has obviously been used as rocket fuel to promote this modern narcissistic cultural bias and spread it beyond national borders as the de facto world culture. Dispelling the importance of morality-based first principles with futile incentives benefiting the ego is how the masses have been distracted to perceive that the only decision worth making anymore has to benefit the self in the short term. The underlying corollary of this immature behavior leads most to dismiss any internal moral compass and leave the door wide open to somehow legitimizing and making the external and artificial bounds of man's law backed by the threat of government violence the only limit worth respecting anymore. This is what I call the if the opportunity presents itself culture, meaning the people that believe that if they can legally do something that benefits them and get away with it in the eyes of the state, then they should. Now, I am sure that most of you believe to be exempt from that bias. If I asked you, for example, whether you would ever accept stolen property, you obviously could not think for one second of yourself to ever be able to do that, right? But then, why are you waiting for government to forgive your student loans? And why did you allow yourself to cash your stimulus check? My family would have enjoyed it as much as you did, yet we didn't cash it, so why did you? That's exactly what I mean by calling it the if the opportunity presents itself crowd. Now go ahead, make all the excuses in the world to justify your lack of spine, but that will not change my point. You see, that's where first principles should stand in the way of animal instincts. Taking part in the largest heist in recorded human history by playing along with a terrorist agenda, one for which we are all paying for 100-fold through inflation today, including those like myself who stood firm, was out of the question for me. I did not need anyone to come explain to me why it was wrong, because objective morality told me everything I needed to know about singling out right action from wrong action. So once again, why did you participate in overt communism? I'm especially talking to my self-labeled conservative and libertarian audience out there. I'll tell you why. Because your relativistic morals are only bound by the threat of state violence, and not by your own morals which you claim you have. In actual reality, most worship money more than freedom, including if it is stolen loot. That's why. And that's my entire point. 
And that unaccountability towards yourself is what needs to change if you are not lying to yourself and others about truly wanting freedom. Instead of dramatically parading with your flag on your porch or your hand on your heart during the national anthem at the ball game, to then turn your back on these values as soon as a mere TV screen scares you enough like a child. This self-centered approach rooted in ego and the general content for the most basic laws of morality is how the population allowed itself to be controlled so easily during the full 19th season. The most prevailing social fracture appeared when the shot question came to the fore as to who would be allowed to survive economically for as long as they went along with letting the state mob take control of their bodies. Ignoring objective morality and not recognizing these blatant crimes is how the public opinion got twisted into accepting that backing human segregation and literal rape somehow magically became doing the right thing. Essentially, what started as an IQ test turned into a morality test. And sadly, even many of those who could see through the lies did not turn their knowledge into wisdom through right action by actually standing on first moral principles and powering through fear and social pressure regardless of the short-term individual consequences. Instead, most willingly traded their integrity for public notes of debt as they gladly let themselves be misled into fearing the short-term outcome when the long-term outcome of giving up on morals and freedom is by far, by far, the worst one. Overrun by their own cowardice and in a sorry attempt to feel better about themselves, this portion of the population had to resort to a stream of asinine lies that they shamelessly told to themselves and their neighbors about how they did it to protect others, when the primary drivers for not growing a spine were nothing else but fear and self-gain. Weakness knows no shortage of imagination when it comes to making up excuses for avoiding right action, looking in a mirror, and taking responsibility for abject cowardice in the face of blatant government blackmail. Anyone will always find a reason not to act morally. At the very least, this episode will have revealed those around you who love to think of themselves as courageous and would look at the German population from the 1940s with disgust from the pedestal of their self-important modern western beacon of freedom. But hard times reveal people's true character, and most did nothing but cave miserably at the first and most likely one of the very few tests of moral fortitude that history will ever put in front of them. The good thing is that now, you all know where you stand on the courage and moral scale. You all know what you're made of. There is no more lying to yourself about who you truly are and whether you were just bullshitting yourself about on which side you would have stood during the darkest times of our most recent history. As it turns out, for most, it was just an act. You see, first principles are meant for hard times. That's why they are principles and not empty, ego-filled bragging claims that will be dropped like a hot potato at the mere sign of real hardship. What people who caved in do not understand is that the easy, seemingly comfortable short-term solution means securing the worst long-term outcome for themselves and others. Tyranny knows no satisfaction until total annihilation of its victims, and there is no complaining your way out of it. Get this across your head once and for all. You cannot appease psychopathy. In fact, what did those who complied really got after a month of mandates over those who did not? Besides the primary effects of a bioweapon that they now cannot untake, basically very similar daily restrictions as those who refuse to comply, and especially nothing but the promise of more of the same for all of us. What did you think? That they were going to let you run free after complying with their mandates? Actually, the opposite is true. It just comforted them in the idea that they can do more to you because the limit has not been reached yet for most apparently. Once again, there is no net upside in compliance, only downside. And as you may surely have noticed, perhaps the very frustrating aspect of this portion of the population is the continued denial of what they keep dismissing as conspiracy theories or disinformation while they are the ones who not only accepted, but are now fully embracing, normalizing, and justifying as part of their daily lives what they used to claim was crazy tinfoil hat talk merely a few months back and has now become documented historical facts of which they are the primary actors and victims. Make no mistake, misery loves company and muddying those who stand firm by dragging them to their level is a behavior seen many times throughout history. These will be the exact same people who will not hesitate to force the central bank digital currency based technocratic control grid and the pseudoscientific biosecurity surveillance system onto those who just want to be left alone and then will brush off how they were in denial all this time by raising the classical dismissal, oh just get over it, it's not a big deal after all. That is why we have to make a choice. We have to accept that there is a fringe of the population which ego is so calcified that it is already gone. No time can be allowed to be wasted on waking them up anymore. Our efforts should be focused instead on those who have the correct intuition that something is very wrong but are still too fearful to either admit to themselves the gravity of the situation or to stand courageously in the face of tyranny.
What I want everyone to understand is that none, absolutely none of what has been planned by the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum, or the similar terrorist cells and think tanks can come about without people's compliance. Listen, these organizations have no power, zero, without one thing. All the followers have been the most instrumental conduit for the implementation of evil since the dawn of times. The psychopathic leadership knows it very well. That's why it seeks to bolster its quota of useful idiots at all costs. Through this global collectivist agenda more than ever, the ultimate goal of governments worldwide is to turn each and every one of us into mindless order-following slaves with no hope for redemption. By promoting genocidal transhumanist ideas parading as evolutionary philosophy, they are now openly declaring that their ultimate plan is to remove humans from their intrinsic ability to ever discover objective morality. How so? by going after the only real threat to their power, which is human God-given ability for free will choice. They know that only free will choice can lead to exercising action that's consistent with natural law. Our peculiar ability as a species to discover and choose right action over wrong action is their single point of failure. And unlike the masses, they most definitely know that the spread of objective morality throughout society would mean the end of the superstition of authority, the end of slavery, and their end as a whole. This obsessive point of attention of their megalomaniac endeavor alone should be more than enough proof to validate that locking us up into slave think forever is the end game that they are after. They know how crucial turning off that cognitive ability is to ensuring the perennial continuity of their power and make it absolutely undisputed. Locking the chessboard in their favor has taken another turn though. They no longer intend to do it through monetary bribes and social engineering as was done up until now, but instead at the biological level. Whether you believe that this plan is real or not is irrelevant. What matters is that they believe in it wholeheartedly. So the responsibility is on you to stop blowing your head in the sand and actually listen to the information that they are blatantly putting out there, as well as keeping track of the steps that they are taking, little by little, unsuspectingly boiling you like a frog. The technique is not rocket science, it's always the same actually. And it has a name, incrementalism sticking their foot in the door, training you like a dog to accept sick ideas like locking yourself down in your own home and advance their sick agenda, one small stately edict at a time, until your freedom is all gone. Now if you are wondering why they would reveal their plan for a global biosecurity slash environmental dictatorship and risk being found out, the answer is threefold. First, they ultimately do not care. These people are primary psychopaths, which implies the belief that they will not get caught. And they know that most people are so faithfully caught up in the religion of statism that most will not believe it anyway. Second, they have now crossed the point of no return in the implementation of their plan, which would now be counterproductive for them to hide anymore. They are going all in for the last blow. And especially number three, these people are master psychologists who actually know you better than you know yourself. And they do grasp fully how natural law works, even though they are hell-bent on having others go against it. You see, there is a good reason why they will never do more than suggesting the agenda and restrict themselves to merely giving orders. If you ever thought that just following orders was enough to wash away your culpability, you need to know the truth. This is not how the universe works. And these people know it full well. They are playing you. That is why they intentionally put the information out there to rob you of any excuse for not knowing and then proceed to give you orders that you and only you remain free to execute or not, regardless of the pressure applied to you. Because pressure is ultimately non-binding, no matter how much in a corner you believe it puts you. These people know that according to natural law, the burden of the responsibility to directly conduct and impose wrong action on others rests infinitely more on the person that actually carries out the order than the person who just dispenses the order. Because the person that executes the order is the ultimate vector that transforms a mere idea into reality. As a result, order followers are the ones taking the bulk of the moral consequences at the soul level for executing the order which almost always results in physical affliction and irreversible psychological damage. Let me ask you, how many times have you heard of a politician getting PTSD after a war? Here you go. Likewise, giving orders an inting hat or openly disclosing their plan is how they can shift the bulk of the blame on you, the useful idiot. 
And that is also why occult circles refer to the police and the military as the dead or their dogs. Because they know that through social engineering, they manage to strip them out of their human free will choice down to the discernment ability of that of an animal. Leveraging their troops' instinctive tribalism to dilute individual responsibility, weaponizing patriotism into a fanatical cult of the state, exploiting fatherly abandonment issues by posing as a fake surrogate family figure, using the monopoly on violence to inspire total impunity and relieve the older followers' feeling of worthlessness and powerlessness, and maintaining them in the religion of moral relativism that is man's law, is how governments have managed to control the most fearful among us. These strategies have a common goal, to calcify the older followers' ego to the point that the content for anything else other than perceived authority is almost unbreakable. This is the process by which primary psychopaths artificially build armies of secondary psychopaths, which they view as the disposable meat sacks used to carry the plan. Those who are ready to sacrifice their souls and suspend their consciousness for a paycheck. Those who would rather have another adult do the thinking for them. You need to understand that after a month of abuse of human rights and after the early wave of truly well-intentioned people who saw through it all and left their ranks, the remaining bulk of the police, military, journalism, health, social media and banking systems have now been purged out of the good souls who exercise the necessary courage and self-respect to say no, stop taking bribes and quit their cult, instead of letting themselves be used as a conduit for enslaving their fellow human beings. The house slaves that still remain in these organizations are only driven by the fear of retaliation and the love of money. How many supposed scientists twisted data in order to protect their funding? How many journalists willfully covered up the truth and disseminated the most egregious and harmful lies in order to keep their position? How many police and military personnel entirely disregarded their oath in order to protect their retirement? How many nurses and doctors intentionally ignored the watershed of health warnings and chose to push deadly therapies anyway in order to protect their license and career? How many bankers organized fund freezing and financial spying on the clients who trusted them in order to protect their paycheck? As always, big talk about promoting science, disseminating truth, protecting freedom, maintaining people's well-being, and looking after fiduciary duties. But when money is on the line, there's nobody left to be seen, because that would take real courage and actual respect for freedom instead of just pretending. As I said, those driven by their vocation and ethics are long gone from these rotten organizations. What is left are now the corrupt auto followers and the paid thugs that will do absolutely anything to you if that means receiving their notes of debt every month. Whether that means forcing a needle into your arm, lying to you, or keeping you under duress so that you behave the way the state wants you to. How many of these individuals do you believe thought about what their limit in executing orders is going to be once tyranny gets on overdrive? At what point will they draw the line and say enough is enough? How much is going to be too much? History has already answered that question many times. The answer is, there is no limit to cowardice and blind obedience. There are no orders that will not be followed. Even if that means committing the most atrocious crimes and later minimize or downright deny wholesale that anything ever happened in the last resort attempt to save their souls. Because whether you are religious or not, you better believe that what we're going through today is a spiritual battle. It is literally a soul harvest. And whether you are in the police enforcing mandates that violate the most basic rights, in journalism robotically spewing government propaganda 24-7, in the judicial system enforcing immoral mandates, a nurse actively dispensing murderous therapies, a banker cutting off resources to a political dissident, or an engineer programming censorship into a social media platform or building the next step that will facilitate our digital shackles, you are the conduit through which tyranny is produced every single day of the week. If that is still you, you need to understand that following orders and abdicating your free will choice 100% is what makes you a bad person, and your masters will not spare you for it. In fact, they have more respect for dissidents, which is why, invariably, all the followers are the number one group to be sacrificed when power is being taken over. You will just be used and discarded like a pawn when the time comes. Because they know that your loyalty is bound by nothing but fear and your short-term opportunistic interests. They know that because you are incapable to stand on first principles, they cannot trust you, and that if caught between a rock and a hard place, you will be the first one to fold and turn on them. That is why you need to change and reclaim your sovereignty and drop out of your state-sanctioned cult, whichever one it may be, for your own sake and that of others. And that is where the second key driver of freedom is needed. The knowledge of natural law is not enough. Knowledge does not become wisdom on its own. 
it is powerless without action. Understanding what is going on while still complying and participating in this worldwide democide is also how evil will triumph. That is why freedom can only come about with a combination of both objective morality and the courage to act upon it in accordance with natural law. What we lived in 2021 and 2022 was just a trial run, meant to train the weak-minded into giving up their rights at a moment's notice without any resistance during what's still to come of their power-grabbing agenda. The global mafia parading as government still needs a lot more chaos to justify deploying their AI control grid over our daily lives and to push the steady dilution of our individual property rights in the name of that phony common good that has been the pretext for hundreds of millions of civilian casualties in the 20th century alone. As always, public safety will remain the number one marketing argument to promote this Bolshevik takeover to the masses. This may take the form of claiming to protect us against the next made-up pandemic, or to prevent some climate change scam narrative that was already supposed to flood our coastlines within 10 years for the past 50 years now. Supposed threats, necessity, and urgency will as always be propagandized to further the collectivist agenda and will eventually be turned against us to justify criminalizing the most basic human freedoms. Soon enough, their goal to achieve a transhumanist future where technocratic control is handed to a pseudo-scientific priest class will be pushed beyond the boundaries of the physical, to entrap our consciousness within the confines of a materialistic world that will be defined by them, and them only. I want to stress for the last time that these plans are not pulled out of a hat. They are out there, spoken, written, and promoted orally and abundantly by the very minds that dictate your own political puppet's decisions. The books, white papers, and conferences are out there for everyone to read, watch, and investigate, including you, if you actually care enough about your future, your freedom, and that of your children. There are no more excuses for anyone to keep ignoring them and pretending that they do not exist. It's high time to snap out of TikTok and stop expecting someone else to do the research for you while you brush it off as mere conspiracy theory, without having done the slightest bit of research yourself. This is no joke. In the words of such twisted minds as that of Yuval Harari, plans are being devised right now to literally conduct a slow genocide of biblical proportions in order to facilitate the implementation of their AI control system. And given how these ideas are being spread out and especially received, it is of the most absolute importance that people integrate the combined notions of objective morality, courage, and natural law in order to understand the scale of the evil at play and stand with a fighting chance on the right side of history. If the past month have demonstrated one thing, it is that we can only expect to secure the freedom that we can defend, and we can defend it by recognizing evil and refusing to partake in their sick plan, at whichever level it might be. We do not have the right to be ignorant and cowardly anymore. Short-sightedly caving to evil, to kick the can down the road and buy a little extra time of comfort, has become so immediately influential to the lives of others that blindly following any orders has now de facto become a literal crime. At all times, we must remember the intentions, but also exploit the weaknesses of those expecting to take over our lives. Because they are not invincible. Far from it. Once again, this gang is nothing without its brain-dead army of paper pushers and all the followers to watch the dirty laundry for them. We can take that power away and instantly regain our freedom with a little willpower by exercising the higher will before our selfish will, meaning acting morally, speaking out about evil instead of cowering in fear, and spreading the knowledge of objective morality. That is the long and short of the freedom formula. Objective morality in action. If humanity wakes up to that notion in great enough numbers, even as those psychopaths will most likely prefer to ravage the world and carry out a scorched earth finale rather than surrendering their power, the ongoing agenda of slavery and death will most certainly collapse unto itself. Psychopathy is so rooted in ego and overwhelmed by such a feeling of undisputed power and impunity that it has no plan B in store. And in the face of defeat, the psychos will clearly turn onto each other, having no sense of moral loyalty to one another other than their common drive to coordinate their takeover for their own selfish gain. Courageously applying natural law in our lives is the antidote to slave think and tyranny. Only from there will we be able to build a decentralized societal organization free from psychopathic interference, but not until. It only depends on you to plan your life accordingly now, take the necessary steps to make yourself as self-sufficient as possible, and position yourself and your family to make non-compliance happen. You do not belong to the state. You are not a slave. So stand up and call out their bluff. It has never been about a pandemic. It's about injecting you with a piece of biological software, engineering an inflationary supply chain collapse, and putting together a programmable control grid. It has never been about the environment and carbon emissions. 
It's about finding new ways to legitimize more control and convince you to give up more of your private property. It is not about Russia. It's about creating energy and food shortages to push you into distress and poverty and coerce you into compliance. Wake up. Stop playing checkers when they're playing chess. Nobody's going to be arrested or indicted by the very system that they created to feed them. Nobody's coming to save us but ourselves. Only you will make it happen. The only way is to stop complying with our own enslavement and turn the tables, spread the knowledge of natural law, grow a spine, and enforce morality in the face of tyranny. It is urgent that we relearn to use the sacred word again. No, our survival as a species depends on it, and this might very well be our last call. of this forced uh, industrial revolution is it doesn't change what you are doing it changes you if you take a genetic editing so does the data about my dna my brain my body my life does it belong to me or to some corporation or to the government or perhaps to the human collective it's often said that you should never allow a good crisis to go to waste because a crisis is an opportunity to also do re good reforms that in normal times people will never agree to, but in a crisis you see we have no chance, so, 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 so let's do it. Now in the past, many tyrants and governments wanted to do it, but nobody understood biology well enough, and nobody had enough computing power and data to hack millions of people. Neither the Gestapo nor the KGB could do it. But soon, at least some corporations and governments will be able to systematically hack all the people. Would constitute a new useless class. When I say that these are useless humans, it's not from the viewpoint of their mother, of the wife, of the, of the son. Humans are now hackable animals. You know, the, the whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. Free will, that's over. That's over.